you so much for being here. Um, we are really excited to have an awesome group of panelists for you today who are going to talk about success in, in academic careers. We have three panelists for today. First, uh, we have Dr. Idalis Flores Caldera. Idalis, say wave. Hola. <laughs> There she is. Um, she is a professor of microbiology and obstetrics gynecology at the Ponce Health Sciences University in Ponce, Puerto Rico. We also have Dr. Rafael Irizarri Quintero. Hola. Hi. Um, Rafa is a professor of biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health. And last but not least, we have Dr. Veronica Segarra. There you are. Um, and she is an assistant professor of biology at High Point University in North Carolina. Um, and so today what we're going to discuss, we're going to talk about um, academic careers. Our panelists are going to share, are going to share their perspectives. Um, they're going to share some of their advice for those of you who are interested or considering a career in, in academia. And there are a couple of reasons why we selected um, these panelists. All right, can you mute your, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so we selected them not just because they are in a diversity of academic careers. Um, some of them are at research intensive institutions or they focus most of their time on, on doing research. Um, some of them split their time between doing research and, and, and actually teaching, doing they're more focused on education. Um, Veronica, for example, is an, a, it's a primarily undergraduate institution. Is that right, Vero? Yeah. Um, so they are in a diversity of careers within academia. They have different trajectories. They're in different research areas. Um, but also we pick them because they, from each of their perspectives, they are engaged in doing ad advocacy, they're involved in doing outreach, and a lot of education. So they're also really, really engaged with society and, and their community. Um, and so it's, it's really a pleasure to, to have them with us. Um, just some of the, the ground rules we're going to be using the raise hand uh, feature if you want to ask questions. So I'll ask a couple of prepared questions, um, some of them based on the ones you sent. Um, thanks to all of you who sent your questions ahead of time. Um, so I'll be asking a couple of questions um, based on that. And then we'll open up the floor so that you can ask all of your burning questions. Um, in the interest of time, try to keep it short. Um, both the questions and the answers so that we can get the, the most out of the 50 or something minutes that we have left together. Um, Giovanna is going to be moderating the questions, so I'll be moderating the panel. And so Giovanna, when, you're, when, you know, when we're ready to have you ask a question, Giovanna will let you know. Um, she'll call out your name and, and you can ask your questions. She'll also be directing questions from the chat because um, I know you are very active on the chat. Um, so, um, where is my note? Ah, all right, um, so let's get started. Um, so I wanna get started with asking each of our panelists, what motivated you to, to go into the career path that you're in? What motivated you um, to go to where you are? Was there a particular moment while you were in in college or in grad school or at one point in your um, in your life where you said you know I want to be faculty um, at, a, at a research institution or I want to focus on teaching um, so what motivated you to do that um, and let's start with Veronica sure so what motivated me to be where I am I think it's, it's been a collection of experiences that have allowed me to define what I want to be doing for a living. As a graduate student, I did a lot of research, of course, 
but I also did a lot of teaching and science outreach, and I loved it all. Uh, I loved it so much that I figured out, I started thinking about how can I combine all of these elements into one career. And so I searched for a long time and I came to the conclusion that a career in academia would allow me to do that. But not just any institution within academia, but rather a smaller institution that focuses on teaching would allow me to have a small research lab, teach a lot, interact with young students all the time, and then do a little bit of uh, science outreach. And so that's what I love about where I am. It combines all of those interests and I'm, I'm able to do all of those things. I might not be able to do all of those, those things at the same time, but maybe a few um, at the same time. And so that's essentially how I, uh, what motivated me to, to, to be where I am. Beto, can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you're teaching? And also, can you tell us a bit more about the outreach, uh, the Eureka outreach program that you're doing and how you bring that into the classroom? Yeah, so right now I teach, in the context of the lab, right now I have six research students. Three of them are doing yeast research at the bench. Three of them are doing science pedagogy research in the context of science outreach. Um, in the classroom, I teach general biology for non-majors in the fall, and my upper level course specialty is cell biology. And I enjoy teaching all of those courses equally. In terms of Eureka, that is an acronym that stands for Emerging Undergraduate Inspired uh, Research Hold on one second, let me write this out. Sorry, it's such a long. Uh, emerging undergraduate research inspired cell art. Um, and so what we're having uh, that program be is it's an outreach program where we bring our undergraduate students to the high schools, um, local high schools that are art focused. We have them explain basic concepts in cell biology to them. And then these are high school artists. And so they have the opportunity to generate art uh, based on some of the things that they learned from our undergraduates. And so it's an outreach project that is innovative because it's trying to incorporate science and art together. And so we just finished that. Uh, it's happening in different stages. Stage one is, you know, undergraduates and high school students meet and do experiments together. Uh, stage two, we allow the high school students some time to generate their art while being coached uh, by our undergraduates through a blog space. And then stage three, we put together an art exhibit. Uh, uh, essentially with the artwork that the high school students generate. And so we built a research project around that. And so um, that's, I think, really cool because three of my undergraduate students who are interested in non-academic careers are experiencing research in another context uh, and are experiencing being scientists in another context that is not at the bench. And so that makes me really happy uh, that I can help them define their, their interests further. Awesome. Um, Rafa, you're muted. <laughs> Gracias. So, yeah, that's going to happen more than once, I bet. Uh, so I don't have any clear defining moments that I can uh, tell you about, but I, I'll tell you like the, the, the individual steps that, that got me to where I am. I, I was a, a math major in, in the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, and I didn't want I didn't want to be a mathematician, uh, and I was trying to figure out what to do. I, I took a bunch of classes from from a percussion to economics to to insurance, and I, I couldn't really find anything that I liked more than math, so I kept I kept I kept at it. And I was I was lucky to be uh, pushed by one of our one of our faculty to go to a summer program for for that, that push that, that encourages students to go into graduate school uh, in Berkeley. And I did go to that. And that that there they encourage you to, to go to grad school, and it worked. I I, I I became interested in going to grad school. By the time I get to to my senior year, I liked statistics and probability uh, the best of all the topics I had learned. 
and I applied to statistics departments uh, across many places in the United States, and I got into Berkeley, which was my top choice. I went there thinking I was going to study probability. Then I, I, I discovered applied statistics while I was there. That was something I didn't know about when I was an undergrad, the, the existence of this field where you, 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 you analyze data uh, for a living. And I, uh, I, I, once I, I um, connected with an advisor, he, he encouraged me to apply to tenure track jobs after I finished, which I did. So you see, it was like, it was like this series of steps of, of just getting somewhere and then taking the next small step, the next small step. So it was no big event that defined uh, how this worked. And I applied to many places, and I, including in biostats, the biostatistics departments, which are like statistics departments, but where they focus on biology applications. And that's, when I interviewed, that's the place I liked the most. So then I became even more applied by going there and, and then started working with collaborators in, in the biomedical fields. And I got even more and more interested in that area and until I, I, I arrived at the research that I'm doing today. And again, it was quite gradual to get there. And that was at Johns Hopkins University where I, where I, where I, where I started. And then I got recruited to Dana-Farber where I have my research lab. And, I'm, and then I'm a professor at Harvard where I do all the, all the teaching I do. So that's, that's, that's the story in, in, in two minutes. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit, there are a few people that are really interested in your side projects. Um, side project. Well, the stuff you do outside of research and teaching. Um, okay. And so I know that you are really involved. You have, even though you've been Hopkins first and now at Harvard, um, you're, you're still involved with the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and you also have this, um, you've been doing some MOOCs, so you've been doing um, some online education through massive online open courses. Mm -hmm. um, so, but particularly with the University of Puerto Rico, how have you stayed involved even though you're not in Puerto Rico? Uh, well, one, one way I've, I've stayed involved is by uh, collaborating with researchers there, I did a couple. I did that with a couple of people when I was uh, starting in. Uh, let me see. That was maybe ten years ago, a little bit more. Uh, and that was that's when I first started meeting people in the in the medical campus. Uh, I, I did my undergrad in Ribera, so I never I never I didn't know these professors, but I still I know a lot of the professors in in my department in, in where I where I went in mathematics, and uh, then, the, so let me go in chronological order. So about five years ago, all the, the MOOCs, the massive online open courses started taking off and became, and I, I got quite uh, interested in that. I thought that was very intriguing where you can teach so many people at once. And I was re hearing the stories of, of people in Afghanistan passing a CS course in Stanford. And I thought that was amazing. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to, to participate in that, I, the idea of possibly teaching a person that is bright and, and motivated and just hap, happened to have the bad luck of being born somewhere where you don't have access to any of this was something that I found very, very uh, appealing. So when I came to some of my college, I, I was going to start that at Hopkins, but it was right when I was moving. So I, it took me a little longer. Some of my colleagues started one. Uh, and they, they were very successful, so that motivated me even more. Uh, they, they teach one that has, I don't know how many, I think they get like a million registrations. And they, th that motivated me more. So when I got to Harvard, I asked if I could do it. And it, so it turns out that the dean uh, of the school where I was going to was, was actually very interested in this particular uh, endeavor. So he was very happy to have me do it. And they, they gave me support to, to do a MOOC on statistics for genomics. The, the reason I picked that was because as, in, at Hopkins, I collaborated with a lot of, of, of biologists and, and it was a moment, I think we're still in that moment, although not as bad as it was 10 years ago, where biologists were all of a sudden, not by choice necessarily, becoming data analysts. And they were, they were in many cases, stuck. They had all this data, they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have the training, they didn't have the time to train or to, to go back to school. 
uh, and, and study statistics and, and computer science. So that, that motivated me to do that particular topic because I knew so many people that were, that were, they were doing data analysis and didn't have this, the time to take courses uh, officially. So that's what I did and that, that was uh, successful. And it was, you know, it was, it was, it motivated even, even motivated me even more. Then at that time, a, a, R, uh, what is it, RFA stand for, a request for applications comes out from the NIH uh, to do MOOCs right as I was finishing mine. So it was perfect timing for me to write an application based on my experience. And I was successful. I got that, that money. And now we're, we're MOOCing like crazy because we have a few dollars to do it. And support, my university, you know, I'm, I'm in a research institute, so there's not, the, the support for teaching is low in terms of, of, uh, of uh, financial support, right? Because you have to raise your, your, your salary mostly by research, but this was a grant now that paid my salary for research. So now I had, I had much more time to invest in this and it's been really rewarding because I get, I have an allotted amount of time just to focus on this. So I'm thinking a lot about teaching and best ways to do it. So then another RFA comes out where it's for MOOCs uh, or for uh, education in big data. It's not for MOOCs. It's education in big data uh, related to, to uh, underrepresented minorities. And it had to be a university uh, that, that had underrepresented minorities and didn't have too much funding. There was some, some, some um, requirements that University of Puerto Rico apply. So I thought this would be a good, a good thing to do with UPR. And I, I emailed them. And we got that grant too, and now we're doing that. I don't know if that was too more than you wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was that was great. Um, Idalis, uh, so what motivated you to to get into the career um, that you're in? Was there a particular moment, and, and what steps did you did you take to get to where you are? Um, yeah, so my, my path, I think it's very similar to Rafa's as I'm hearing him speak and I can recognize some of the, these moments in my life. Um, so it was basically my love for science. I've always been very good at science. That was my, my favorite subject at school, at college. And the fact that very uh, key people in my life, meaning my professor of microbiology in, in Colegio de Mayagüez, identified me as a, as a potential person that could pursue a, a PhD degree. And at the time, I, I didn't know any of that. I was studying industrial microbiology and thinking I would go into industry because that was the main, you know, the main focus of that bachelor's degree. And that was, that was it. That was the plan um, until I got the opportunity to go to a summer research program at um, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And that was because this particular person, Dr. Mildred Chaparro, in Mayagüez gave me the application. You have to fill out this application. You're going to this summer program. So in a way, my path hasn't been really self-directed as it has been kind of um, a series of events that have just uh, bumped into me and gave me and uh, moved my, my path along the way. And it was um, meeting all these people along the way that, have, that opened my eyes at what research was, I, I understood this is what I wanted to do once I knew what a PhD was all about. And after that summer experience, I knew this is something that I w would like to do. I was still not sure what it was all about. I was sure, though, that I didn't want to be a medical doctor. I, I know that for a fact. Um, so I applied for several um, PhD programs. I was accepted at Rutgers University. They gave me full scholarships. And then I applied for an NSF fellowship. I also got that full scholarship. So little by little, as I was walking in this path, the doors opened for me, just like amazingly. It was, it was, it was awesome. And I felt like uh, this is this must be the right path if all, all of these things are falling into place. Um, I was doing, I did very well academically at Rutgers, even though there were challenges like the English. Uh, I, I, was, I did not speak English very well at, at the time, and I, I thought it was very, very challenging to be in a classroom of 200 students taking biochem, and you're not sure what to do with your pencil. Do I listen to the professor? Do I take notes? Do I record this class? Do I, what do I do? Do I write in Spanish or in English? 
So it was, it was very, very challenging for me, the English barrier. Um, but I got A's. <laughs> I got A's in the exam. So again, showing me that I could, I could do this, I could pursue that. Um, so once you're in research and we're in an in a academic laboratory, it's just, for me, it was very easy. It, it just, again, the flow of things. I knew I had to be in an academic institution. Um, coming to Puerto Rico, I'm right now, I'm, I'm for the past 20 years of being a professor at Ponce Health Sciences University, formerly Ponce School of Medicine. And um, so it was also an opportunity knocking at my door again. I, I wanted to do a postdoc and I did um, submit some applications in the States. But in my heart, I, I knew I wanted to some, someday come back. And when I applied, and now I know. When I knew about a position at, at Ponce Health Sciences, I applied and, um, and I got this position. Again, doors opening. They, they so needed a professor at that time to fill in for a professor who was just retiring. So it was, it was perfect timing. And, and, and from then on, it, it just, uh, it, it, everything fell into place. I'm not saying it's as easy as that. Um, it's just that what I'm saying is that um, the, your God feeling will tell you you're in the right track. When things like this happen, um, despite the challenges and despite the, the, the bad news and the bad things that may happen, because so many, so many other things are good things are happening along the way, and they continue moving you forward. Um, the bottom line is that at the end, you just focus on, you should focus on the, on the positive, on the doors that open um, for you. And, and in terms of something really uh, important in my scientific life and, 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 and uh, um, something that really showed me you can make it, like you can make it in, in research was when an RFA, that you, you know now what an RFA is, came out um, for um, R01 uh, to study a, the disease I was interested in. And it was a, a disease is called endometriosis. And at the time, nobody knew what this disease was about. And people actually were telling me, why, why would you study something like that that nobody talks about and nobody knows about? What, why don't you just study cancer, which you know actually kills people and things like that? Um, and then RFA came um, very, very particular to um, gynecologic uh, uh, conditions and genetics associated to that. And, um, and I applied to that and I got this, uh, my first um, R1 award. And, and, and again, it, it was just um, really like a, like a message that I, I, had, I had made it. I, I think uh, I was in the right track and continue to do so. Right now, I don't add this R1, uh, it's uh, lapsed, but I still uh, can, uh, can say that fruits are still being produced from those, uh, those networks that I was able to establish with that funding. And I continue to do research and endometriosis and uh, uh, considered, um, I'm happy to say, considered uh, uh, an expert in the field and being invited to many different panels and work groups in the area. And I'm an international ambassador for endometriosis in the Latin America. So it's, it's been a very fulfilling career for me. Very, very happy I chose this path. Awesome. Um, so very briefly, you touched on this just now. Um, so the research that you're doing, it has a lot more translation and, and clinical implications. Um, and so you're involved in doing a lot of, of advocacy and, um, and outreach work with, with patients. Um, can you tell us briefly about that and how, you know, how that, sure. how, that, how can you combine that with the, the research that you're actually doing in the lab? Remember when I said I didn't want to be a medical doctor and I thought I don't want to deal with patients? <laughs> well, guess what? When I started doing my, my, when they got my grant and I wanted, I needed samples, I had to talk to who? Patients who are going to be my uh, subjects in my research. But what I found out as they, as I was trying to consent them for the research part is that they had so many questions that nobody had answered so many doubts nobody nobody knew uh, much about their disease and i would be half hour an hour talking to them crying with them and uh, me uh, being sort of like a psychologist
psychologist to them. So I knew right there that they needed, um, they needed to be educated about their disease and, and supported um, also. So then um, I decided that we needed to do something about it. We uh, founded a, an association, uh, advocacy association for patients and their family members. I'm part of the board. Um, of directors. Uh, it's been over 10 years of patient education activities. Every year we celebrate March as um, endometriosis awareness month. We go to the le legislature to talk about the disease and its impact. We bring statistics to the health uh, and the Department of Education. Uh, so in all, we're trying to be in the media and the social media as well, and regular media, and trying to uh, raise awareness of this disease and its impact. And it's been really, really, um, and I would really recommend you as researchers that if you want, if you have the opportunity to add to your research, and all you can do as a researcher for society, but if you can add on to that, outreach and um, participate in even creating or being part of any foundation for the patients of the disease that you study for those of you in biomedical sciences do it because it's, it, it really just brings another dimension to your work awesome um, so i want to open up the floor to questions i see one really great question that a lot of people are agreeing with and i think probably a lot of you even though you haven't express your approval, um, I think you probably are thinking about this, and it's about how different things are from, particularly when you, Idalisa and Rafa, when you started um, in, in, in your careers, things are much more competitive now in terms of, of getting academic positions and, and getting funding, um, not just for research, but also for educational initiatives uh, from both the NIH and the National Science Foundation. Um, and so it'd be great if you can speak to, you know, there's, there, there are people that are interested, even though it, it, it is more challenging probably to go into academia now, um, you know, if you have any advice for people that are interested in, in going in, into the academic route? The research, research academic route, you mean? Or, yeah, I mean, yeah, just I mean, from your perspective, the research academic route, but um, Beto can speak more from the, the teaching perspective. So it's true that, that the, funding, uh, the funding levels are lower than they were um, in the er, in early 2000s. Uh, they're getting better. They just, they just, the NIH just got a big bump, of two billion dollars. So that's that's better. That the NIH is is prioritizing uh, uh, first. What do they call it? New investigators and early stage investigators. So in some institutes, the pay lines are up, are up to like almost the same levels actually than they were 15 years ago. We don't know. Well, hopefully that stays that way. You you never know. But yeah, for the last three or four years, five years, it was it was pretty rough. The pay lines were down to ten percent, meaning that only ten percent of grants uh, got funded at each round. Meaning, and you get two chances, so that takes it up to like a success. Rafa, your sound is off. We can't hear you anymore now. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Um, I can comment on that. Um, yes. Also, yes, there's there's good news, uh, as Rafa was saying. And also, I, I know somebody uh, in the list of questions I got, they were asking about R1s and R1s. And I, I sometimes we talk this. R1 is like the the biggest grant that you'll get. There's so many other baby steps that you need to take. There's many other opportunities and not only uh, from the NIH or NSF so you have opportunities coming from private foundations or uh, trusts like the Puerto Rico Science and Technology Trusts um, um, then you have uh, award developmental awards like the K awards and the uh, then comes the RO3s and the R21 which are smaller grants so so you build up um, starting from smaller grants, initiatives such as 
for example, program grants. Some institutions have U54s, have U01s. So there's other types of opportunities beyond just the regular NIH um, grants or NSF grants that we know of. And uh, we, we should take advantage of them as we build up our career. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, yeah, so the other point I was going to make was that it's, it, it depends also on the, in the area you are. And uh, I'm fortunate to be in an area that is, is the demand for, for people with PhDs in, bio, in statistics, biostatistics, data science is actually growing. Uh, so for, for our specific field, it's, it's better than it was 10 years ago in terms of, of positions. In terms of funding, the, even though, the, and this is, uh, this is related to what Elise was saying, even though you may, it may be hard to get an R1 in terms of just the, 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 the percentages, we are asked to collaborate uh, a lot, uh, quite a bit because um, there's so, so many grants need data analysts that, that we are, we are uh, in high demand to be collaborators and you do get your salary covered by, by this. So even though it's not your own research, it's still something at least I enjoy doing very much. It's basically just working with a biologist and being there their, their support, their statistical support, which doesn't mean that you're just doing silly calculations for them. In, in, in many cases, you become a full-fledged uh, collaborator, part of the lab, and, and, and get, you, know, you're, you're, you write papers together, you supervise students together. So at least in my field, I don't feel that they're, they're, the, the things are worse. I actually think, feel things are better now that they were 10 to 15 years ago. I, I under, and I understand that in biology, it's not quite the same. There's, the, the there there are more PhDs in biology than they are in statistics, so there's so that 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 makes it a little bit tougher to get an academic job, um, and and similarly the the grants there there's not as there's not as much um, demand for biological support as there is for statistical support in in, in totals, so that's that's my own experience. Beto, do you want to add anything? Sure. I think one of the keys to stay competitive and current in a harsh funding environment is you need to drive yourself to be innovative. You need to drive yourself to be a scholar within a, an area where you're setting yourself apart from the crowd. Uh, you need to be filling a gap. Uh, that might be in a particular area of research. That might be an in innovation of teaching methods right pushing the envelope in either area and so I think as long as you're constantly striving to do that you are going to even if things get hard you're gonna be in a better position than the crowd all right thank you um, okay so let's let's take your questions um, you can use the chat or you can use the raise your hand probably Preferably use the raise your hand because um, then we'll get a deluge of questions through the chat. Um, so raise your hand and then Giovanna will call out your name so that you can ask. Oh, come on, I know you have questions. Gabriel, ah, ah. <laughs> Laura, Laura tiene una pregunta. Uh, Laura, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, um, so what challenges have uh, had Idalis and Veronica as, as women in, in academia? I mean, we have seen a growth in, in women that that is uh, that are in, in positions in science, but do you have any, any additional advice for women? I can, I can comment on that question. Um, I think I think when I see myself as a scientist and as a teacher, uh, yes, yeah, sometimes there are times when people's comments or demeanor might make you think of yourself as a 
woman of Lat uh, La Latina, right? Uh, but I tend to revert back to the idea that I am doing this, the job that I'm doing, the work that I'm doing, I'm doing it because I'm a scientist, I love science, I love my students, and I want to bring opportunities to them. And so I always revert back to that. So yes, there are th uh, harsh things that will come your way, maybe, com you know, um, comments or uh, difficulties, but I think as long as you're, you're strong in your uh, goal of where it is that I want to be, you will be fine. And so that's what I tend to focus on. Uh, I'm doing this for the science, for my students, and so everything else is secondary. Yeah, you know, uh, a weird comment will demoralize anyone, right? But I don't let it, I don't, I don't, I don't stay in that place, in the dark place for a long time. Hope that helps. Yeah, I, I, I want, yeah, I want to add to, to Vero, I, I feel we shouldn't define ourselves as, as women scientists, just scientists. That's what we are. Uh, it's very important also to be surrounded uh, and look uh, for mentors that are women uh, and and to see like in your own institution, you'll see uh, faculty members, you'll see people in the administration that are, that are women that have, um, have made it. And so look up to them and, and, and uh, talk to them, make a group uh, of, of, of friends within uh, at, at work that you can talk issues such as um, family matters that of course are, are, are issues that uh, are culturally uh, as women, we all know that it might impact us more. And I'm not saying this in, in a general way, but it, that it may, <laughs> let's clarify, may impact us as, as mothers and in as, and a cultural society as, uh, as the Puerto Rican. Um, but uh, apart from that, um, not to not put that, that uh, sign on, on your, you just say, you just think of yourself as a, as a scientist. Okay, uh, Gabriel had a question uh, for Idalis. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so my my question is, um, so could could you have done your research in the United States? So when you finish, I'm assuming your PhD and you got that R one. Why why choose Puerto Rico? And in terms of research environment. And like, how, how do you end up in Ponce in, instead of any other university? And have you had any challenges working in Puerto Rico instead of working in the United States in terms of the research wise? Very good question. Yes, actually, I think I got my R1 because I was in Puerto Rico studying the Puerto Rican population, the genetics of the Puerto Rican population. If I had been in the States in a Caucasian predominant institution, I don't think I would have gotten that grant. Um, so yes, it was uh, really, really, uh, it was really important uh, for me to be here and to study the, the genetics contribution of endometriosis in the population. And that what, that's what made my grant unique. Uh, uh, that's what I, at least I perceive it that way. And also the, the preliminary that I preliminary data that I have showing that yes, our, our population was very particular in the genetic composition. Um, why why Ponce? Uh, as I said, I was I I went I went looking for a job in many different institutions and often uh, Ponce gave me the opportunity. So so it was it, it was um, the opportunity knocking on my door. So. After that, I was very grateful to be there at Ponce. It's a small institution that um, provided me with a nurturing environment in which to grow. It provided me with something that at first I thought that you could think that it's a, not a good thing in science, which is to be the only person studying a disease. Uh, but what happened was that then I was surrounded by physiologists, neuroscientists, geneticists that were my colleagues and my friends, and I got them interested into studying endometriosis. And now from a project that began with me, just one person studying endometriosis, now I have seven or, or eight colleagues that they do their, their work their general work, you know, their interest in cancer or neuroscience or whatnot, but they also collaborate with me. Um, so that that was really awesome. I found a, a niche 
And I think uh, Vero mentioned that. That's very important to find a, a niche, a disease that nobody cared about or no, very few people uh, studied. But I, I found a niche and, a, and I found a population that was very interesting to study that disease on. Great. Um, I'd like uh, for people to raise their hands if uh, they, ha they have some experience coding or they know some coding. And then I'm going to ask a question to Rafa that uh, Jailene post on the chat. How many of you know how to code? All right. Rafa, while people are raising their, their hands, how important do you think it is as a scientist uh, in different, you know, a range of different areas to know how to code or to have some proficiency with computer science? Okay. Well, those are two different things. Uh, coding is uh, is key in some fields, like uh, in, in anything involving uh, data analysis, you need to be able to code uh, the scripts that analyze the data. These days, it used to be that you could do it in Excel. That's, that's getting uh, harder and harder. Uh, I, I mean, and there's, other, there's obvious fields like, like, that, like computer science where it helps to, to code, but you'll be surprised how, how, how uh, how many bad coders there are in, in computer science? Uh, it's you know because they, they study more of the theoretical aspects of, of of computer programs. Now what I what I would say is that even more important than coding is to is to know to in, how to interpret data, which go, these days goes hand in hand with learning to code. You you if, I, I'm sure many of you have have run experiments that have generated uh, data where the answer isn't obvious, and you've you've been asked to to extract information from that data. And doing that properly is, is, is important. Where coding comes in as an important skill is where you, where, where you are going to be able to uh, write scripts that are reproducible. When you do it with point and click, if you want to do it again, you might not remember exactly how you did that. If you write a little script, then you can go back and, and redo it and check. And it's easier for others to check what you did. Uh, or if you have to come back to the paper in six months, you have a little script that you can see exactly what you did. So anything involving uh, enough data analysis, I would say that coding is, is, a key, uh, is a key skill to have as a scientist. And I'll, I'll add that there's many fields where, you, where you, you don't have to do that, and then I would say it's not necessarily something uh, you need to learn. Great. We actually have a question that uh, Ivelisse posed that a lot of people are agreeing that's an important question. Ivelisse, do you want to ask it yourself? Yes, I, uh, I have a question. And is how difficult is it to make a transition from a university in the United States or let's say um, a position in the United States and then moving on to Puerto Rico and whether what what point in your career you should do that you should should you do that when you have an established career or <clears throat> early on in your career how difficult would that be and more so with the economy uh, as bad as it is right now well I guess I should answer that I'm the only one <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the, on the only one in the panel who is in Puerto Rico. Well, I came back 20 years ago, so the situation was definitely very different. Uh, coming back to Puerto Rico and adapting uh, to Puerto Rico again after seven years in the States oh, was hard. It was, it was not easy. You have like a, I call it a counter-cultural shock. <laughs> Um, and you have to readapt that the uh, how things are in Puerto Rico, but we are from here, or most of us are from here, so so we will. Um, you have to adapt to things like uh, things are slower, ordering of supplies will take longer, so you have to plan better. Um, things like that, more more logistics of of the things that in the states or in the big institutions where probably you are, it's kind of it's transparent. You need media. You go to a down the hall and there's media made for you right for some of you and there the tips are autoclave for you and things like that you have a full-time tech technician working for for a big lab 
Uh, so maybe not so here. <laughs> However, um, as I said, there there's also other other things that uh, that I like about working here. Uh, some have to do with the mostly with the the people, the actual patients that I interact with, and my and my group of people that I work with. Uh, it, it's very uh, it's a very con, um, congenial uh, group of people. It, it, it's very easy to work with. Uh, people collaborate, um, and patients also are, are very willing to to collaborate and share and answer your questions and give you samples and, and whatnot. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, there are challenges, but there's also opportunities. Things like the the Puerto Rico uh, Science Research and Technology Trust is working very hard to try to attract scientists. To the island, there is a law, Ley 101, uh, that provides tax incentives for uh, investigators with R type grants that want to come back to Puerto Rico. And the, sal the salaries, the component of the salaries from the grants is, is completely 100% tax free. Um, so, where there's crisis, there's also opportunities. And I can tell you that Ponce Health Sciences University just recruited four faculty. It's also, it's also a private institution, so it won't be affected as bad as the uh, government ones. Oh, that's another thing. So what was really a kind of like a negative thing about our institution, now it's, now it's a good thing. All of a sudden, we don't depend on dollars from the government. Um, so when, when you're, I hear store horrible store horror stories, I say, we just recruited four, four faculty. And our classes are, are increasing and the facilities are increasing. So where there's crisis, there's opportunities. 70% yeah. of the UPR's budget comes from the state. So when that money disappears, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Ponce, but there's Ponce, other is not, Ponce is not in that situation. Huh? Yeah, that's right. So Ponce is not in that situation. Ponce health is. So I think it's, it's, uh, a good take home message and to make it a little bit more general that when you're considering where you're going to be working, you're going to have to think about things like what the institution is like, where they're getting their funding from, are they expecting that you do research versus teaching? And um, related to that teaching question, I want to give the mic to Christian Sayed, who had a question. Go ahead, Christian. Oh. <clears throat> Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm interested in the in this uh, uh, combination, like Veronica seems to, uh, to be doing in, in currently with uh, the teaching and the research. And so uh, there's some uh, I've heard of uh, and read of some fellowships that enable you as a postdoc to be able to do both, because one thing that uh, has been said previously is that sometimes you are prepared well in the area of research but not necessarily on the teaching aspect and so they're they're more conscious of this now than they have these fellowships so I guess the question is like uh, Giovanna said uh, uh, what are fellowships or grants that can help you obtain these types of jobs? Sure I think that that type of grant or program can certainly help you it two ways it makes it easier for you to while you're doing research it makes it easier for you to gain access to resources that will make you a better teacher they will formally train you in the best practices in science pedagogy and that will look very very attractive to people looking at your cv uh you know for a position at a primarily undergraduate institution uh, another benefit of those programs is that they help you identify scientific advisors that are okay with you having that teaching interest. So they facilitate some of the uh, difficult conversations that sometimes need to happen. That said, uh, you don't need to be part of one of those programs to transition from a research intensive position to a teaching uh, uh, intensive position. You can make, so to speak, uh, your own ERACTA program. It'll take a little bit more work. So if you do apply to one of these programs and you end up not getting it, I wouldn't be too discouraged. 
in the sense that you can, while you're doing a postdoc, you can look for ways in which you can build up your teaching experiences, of course, with your PI's permission and approval, which can be sometimes a little tricky to get, right? Uh, which is one of the benefits of uh, programs like the Iracta program. Um, so I think you can certainly go both, both ways. For example, me, I, I essentially made my own way. Uh, and that actually made it easy. I had more opportunities to network, partly because I was, I was being proactive about looking for opportunities. And so that helped me generate the drive that I needed to, to network and meet people. And you know, I, I was of this idea like, oh, I need to make this happen. And so I need to make sure I make this happen. Nobody's make, gonna ha make it happen for me. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, there's a couple of questions here that relate to uh, the general topic about how different institutions deal with salaries for faculty members. I wonder if you all can talk a little bit about that. Um, are, what are the differences in terms of, you know, an institution that's more focused on research versus an institution that expects you to teach more? Um, are there any trends in how salaries are managed for the professors and in terms of how much you have to write for grants and that type of thing? And is that changing? Hmm. Well, well, do you want me to answer that one? What do you mean? Uh, so there's a lot of variability for institution from institution. I have I wrote something on this on I, I have a blog uh, that I'll put it on the chat so you can read some details about different positions. This was written for statisticians, but it's similar for others. So I would I would split university uh, tenure track jobs into three. One is a what we call hard money position. And that's when the institution get, pays nine months of your salary, 75% of your salary is covered by the university uh, and you do not have to raise any, any of that. You have to teach though, that's, what, that's how the, the, they justify paying you this. We always remember, all, everything in the universities, are, are, they're, suppo they're supposed to spend what they get, so any money you get, you're going to be doing something for it. So if you're getting 75% of your salary, you're probably going to be t doing more teaching. In the summers, then you can, you can get grants to do research uh, or not. So that's one type of, 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 of a position. Then there's the other one where we call soft money institutions, and these can go anywhere from, it's the opposite side, where you can go anywhere from 75% to 100% of your funds come from your own grants that you have to raise uh, you have to raise your own um, grants. So that means that you're writing a lot of grants and you're teaching less. So the, the, if, if, if they give you 20%, usually that means that you're teaching one semester class a year. So if you are more interested in research and want to spend most of your time doing research, that's where you want to go. That's probably where you want to go. If you want to uh, do more teaching, then you probably want to go to a, to a hard money institution. Now, the, the, within those two extremes, there's all kinds of, of intermediates uh, where you do a little bit more teaching. There's places that are very rich that, that actually pay, pay uh, hard money even without teaching requirements. And that you, when you're out going for a job, you gotta ask that. Those, that's one of the most important questions you, you need to ask. What am I expected, how am I expected to, 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 to raise my salary? Uh, how, how many classes am I supposed to teach? And remember, there's a balance. The more you teach, the less time you have for research and vice versa. Uh, and then the third, the third type of uh, research job that, that I, would, I would mention are the um, uh, acad uh, ac academic industry jobs, where you, you, the, the company basically pays your salary to do research. There's a little bit more of constraints. Uh, because they, they, the research typically is expected to help the company in some way. Uh, and there's a few exceptions to that. Microsoft research, for example, is kind of a dream job where you just get paid to do whatever you want. Uh, and, but that's, that's kind of an exception. There's not too many uh, jobs like that. Uh, so that, I think I covered the, the basics. And, but within those, there's a lot of, 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 different, of differences. You want to, if you're out going for a tenure track job, that is something that you have to figure out before you get there, because you don't want to get you don't want to be surprised.
Yeah. Nelly. Oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Quick comment. Even even within uh, pre uh, primary undergraduate institutions, there could be very very big differences from institution to institution. Like for example, a new faculty at a particular PUI or primary undergraduate institution can be provided with a startup to to set up a lab. There are some that will not provide you with this. Mm -hmm. And so these are all things that you want to research and find out when you're considering a position. Good. And I was also going to ask you, at least, to jump in and talk a little bit about the landscape in Puerto Rico um, for those that are interested in positions specifically in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, apart from what uh, Rafael just mentioned, I wanted to add um, institutions such as Ponce and Health Sciences where we are not tenure tracked, uh, we're offered a, a contract. And um, because it's a medical school or a professional school, the teaching load is really, I would say, is very comfortable. So I get to do what I uh, most like, uh, which is research and teaching at a basically 70-30 ratio, so 70% research, 30% uh, uh, teaching, which is perfect for me. So for some of the people that might not work, but if, if that's a kind of ratio that you like, then medical schools uh, such as uh, Ponce, School, Ponce Health Sciences uh, might be, a, or similar institutions like that, it, it's, um, it's an option, it's a good option. Uh, we, you do also have to participate in uh, committees, academic committees and things like that, but um, you would you would be doing research most of the time. And your base salary is not, it's not as competitive as the base salaries of the UPR, um, I have to admit. <laughs> but it's still a comfortable, a, a comfortable base salary that, you can, uh, that serves as a good cushion. And then that it actually motivates you to work hard and getting your, your grants, uh, which would uh, supplement your salary. So you have 100% of your time um, to, to kind of add on uh, grants upon grants until you reach that maximum. Um, and it's up to you. You can do, you can have one grant or you can have, you know, so many other grants and, and, and be very comfortable. I think um, for me uh, in Puerto Rico, I think my, my salary it gives me a very comfortable uh, status of living. I'm, I'm very pleased. And I, I should mention that we, we've all talked about the United States. There's Europe is different and there's, you know, that you can look into that as well. They, they tend to have more hard money uh, in their positions that they do in the U.S. Okay, great. I hope that um, helped clarify some of the landscape. We have one last question. We're at the very end, um, but I think it's a very important question. Um, for all the panelists, uh, how important have uh, mentors and sponsors, uh, sponsors being people that have kind of opened doors, looked out for you, you know, promoted you for fellowships or opportunities, how important have those type of people been in getting the positions where you are currently at? Um, we heard a little bit from Idali, so maybe You're muted, Giovanna. <laughs> You're still okay. muted. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, Idaris told a little bit about her experience with a particular mentor that pushed her along. So maybe Veronica and Rafa have um, additional things to add? Uh, I have something to add. I think early in my, as a graduate student, I had to learn the difference between a scientific advisor and a mentor. Those two things oftentimes don't go hand in hand. Early on, I had really strong, really good scientific advisors, which I'm very thankful for. You need those, right? You need to learn how to be a good scientist. And then later on, um, as a postdoc, and as I started exploring a little bit more broadly, this uh, research and teaching space, I came across people that have become mentors. Um, and so, yes, they've been very very beneficial and helpful. I would say that they would they have indirectly helped me uh, get to where I am. Um, so I'll leave it at that.
Rafa, do you have anything to add? If, if not, uh, Marvin has a question that he's been raising his hand patiently for. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I, I have had very important mentors and promoters. Is that the word you use? Promoters? Uh, sponsors. What did you say? Sponsors. Sponsors. Yeah, that has been very important in my career. My chair, the first chair I had was really important in my career. He, he supported me uh, and he, he was also a mentor. He told me what to do, what not to do. I had, I had, I've had many mentors. I always am open uh, to suggestions. There's a saying in, in Spanish, cogiendo consejo se llega viejo. That's something you want to uh, keep in mind. Uh, in English, it means uh, if you listen to advice, it doesn't rhyme. But it's, if, 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 if you listen to advice, you get, you, you, you get to uh, age well. <laughs> so... Uh, but I, one thing I would say about that's that's just been luck, right? You just happen to run into these people, and and that that, that help you out. Uh, so I don't know what you can do to to meet people like that. But what I would say is that when you're looking for an advisor, uh, either postdoc or graduate student, you want to to study where their former lab members ended up. And, and don't be don't be too seduced by by uh, nice people and uh, fun people because that doesn't necessarily translate into being a good mentor. Sometimes good mentors are are, are serious and, and and maybe not that fun. It happens sometimes. Uh, so, so look at that. Look at the data, and 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 make sh and that that will show you. I, I've known I've known very famous bio, uh, scientists that uh, when you look at their students, they, they don't have any students that have been successful. And, and, they're, and they have these grand, grand personalities that everybody loves them. But uh, that says something about how, how good mentors they are. So that's something I would recommend to, to, to folks like you to look at that. Good. And we have one last question. I know we're a little bit over time, but I think it's an important question. Marvin, if you want, can I ask it quickly? Yeah. So. So we as a scientist, we usually focus a lot on doing research, but I know that, you know, there's life out of the, of the lab. So I wanted to know uh, how do you ba do a good balance of life and work? I know the academia job is very demanding, so how do you do that? You, you have to plan for it. You have to plan for, for the time that you need to sort of do non-scientific stuff, it's important uh, that you actually set up this time apart. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, it's going to help you to release uh, stress. It's going to uh, help you to reconnect with your family. Uh, it's, uh, so it, it's important that you make specific uh, time set apart uh, to do all that. It's going to energize you. And when you come back on, on, on Monday morning, you, you'll come ready to, to tackle, tackle the problem uh, at hand. So it, it's very important that you set up a limit. Uh, for instance, don't, I, don't, I don't read any emails on, on Sunday afternoon. I, 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 maybe Saturdays I will, but Sundays I, I'll try to protect that time because I want to be uh, without any stress and I want to devote that time to my family. So you actually have to be proactive about it. You're muted, Rafa. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. So I, I would say that has been the hardest part of my career is time management. We're not trained in time management, and, and, I, and for some reason, there seems to be this correlation between being an academic and being bad at time management. So think that through. Uh, don't be, a f you're gonna have to say no a lot, and it's hard for, especially for people who, who like to help. Uh, it's very hard to say no, but you just have to. You have to remember that you have, if you have a family in particular, uh, you, you have to remember, if I say yes to this person, uh, it means I won't see my family. I'll see them less, two less hours, five less hours. Traveling, I, I try to, to not travel as much as others in, 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 uh, at my level uh, because, again, it just, it's, a, it's time. And it's sometimes hard to say no to an invitation to, say, you know, Barcelona or Paris. So, you're gonna be playing so yeah, so I would say as, as, a, as a general advice is, is to really think through 
what what it what how much time you actually have like maybe even sit sit down and write it out like i have eight hours or nine hours or ten hours a, a day whatever you decide multiply it by f whatever it is for uh 200 and whatever it is days in, in a year uh work is in a year and then start you know cutting it out this much research and when you do that exercise you're going to see there's very little time uh for 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 or anything else other than, than research teaching and, and whatever your whatever committees you, you have to serve on so learn to say no I would also add to that that we love science and you probably want to be a happy scientist and so if you're not a happy scientist right now there's probably something that you could tweak something that you could change uh, a change in your in your schedule and how you exercise how you eat so that you can shift uh, to becoming a happier scientist, right? Because you're in this for, for a long time, right? It's about persistence. And so I would say that you need to uh, think to yourself, what needs changing? I want to be a happy scientist. Yeah, there's this idea now, people are less and less talking about work-life balance and they're talking about work-life integration. Um, so the reality is that time management is a challenge. I mean, I think it's a challenge for for all of us, nobody really teaches you how to do time management and a lot of other things that you need to be a successful scientist and you know, that's why we're all here um, with, with, this, um, with this program. Um, and so you know, I, I think about it in that way. I think about how do I integrate all of these things that I am doing and that I'm passionate about um, and then, yes, learning how to say no, is, it's the hardest thing, but it's really, really important um, to do. And so with that, um, fortunately, we're out of time. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for your questions. Thank you particularly to Rafa, Vero, and Idalis for, for being our panelists today. We really, really appreciate your time. We know that you're busy, um, and so we really appreciate taking the time for, um, to be with us. Um, you have, so for the fellows, you have our contact information. If you have any pressing questions, you can contact them, um, but also for you, be respectful of their time. Um, and so, yeah, and so with that, um, thank you so much. So this, uh, this panel was recorded, we'll post it online, we'll let you know when it is online. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody.